Well, good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about Acts 19 and 20, and it's been a very exciting journey as we've gone through Acts. Uh, I feel so blessed I've been able to do the morning devotions, so not only do I get to preach on it occasionally, I get to go uh, right through the whole book, and it's been the most amazing journey for me spiritually. And this morning, I, I named my message Paul the Ultimate Maximizer. And if you've ever heard about a maximizer, um, maximizing is making the very best of, of every situation. So I had a look in the dictionary. So um, what a maximizer is, is a maximizer is an individual who consistently seeks to the optimal outcome of any endeavor. Maximizers tend to be perfectionists, but the terms maximizer and maximizing are particularly associated with decision-making processes rather than describing a generally uncompromising approach to life. Maximize, to increase, to a greater possible amount or degree, to give the highest estimate to, to make the fullest use of. So I think Paul was definitely a maximizer because as we look at everywhere he went um, through his journey, and, and in chapter 19 we're commencing his third missionary journey, um, he maximized every situation. He didn't waste a second, and that is so incredible to me. So as we look at the map now of the third missionary journey, we'll see that Paul has gone from his home church of Antioch in Syria, and he's leaving this time via land, and he's travelling back to Antioch, sorry, to Ephesus. And if you recall, when he was in Ephesus last time, they begged him to stay on, but he did one sermon in the synagogue and said, I'll be back. I guess we've heard somebody do that before, I'll be back. So um, he travels to Ephesus, and the interesting thing is while he is doing that, there's something happening in Corinth. Tiv did, a, did a, um, an introduction to a man by the name of Apollos. And Apollos was an Alexandrian who was a well-educated, absolute rock of um, preaching power that had come to settle in Ephesus and to preach there. He was amazing, but something happened in his preaching. If you remember, Paul had gone back um, to Jerusalem and he had left Aquila and Priscilla in charge of Ephesus at the time. So they listened to Apollos preach and Apollos, they noticed, had something missing in his whole package. And so they invited him into their home and they asked him what was going on and they discovered that he had only understood up to Paul's baptism, Paul's baptism that was a Jewish baptism of immersion and forgiveness of sins rather than the immersion of um, into Jesus and then, of course, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they filled Apollos in with what had been missing for him. So what had happened at at, um, when, at Pentecost when the, the Spirit came and poured out and there was the speaking of tongues and prophesying and that miraculous event that was so, so incredible. And so be between Priscilla and Aquila, they equipped Apollos to be a much better uh, preacher and to have full picture, including the power of the Holy Spirit. So he goes now off after that to Corinth and he's ministering there. And so while he's doing that, we pick it up and it says that um, Paul in, in verse 1 of, of chapter 19 says, while Apollos was ministering in Corinth, Paul travelled through the regions of Turkey until he arrived at Ephesus where he found a group of 12 followers of Jesus. Now, these 12 followers of Jesus were an interesting group. And it's interesting with Paul, if I back up just a second, is that Paul had revisited all the churches that he and Barnabas had planted on their first trip um, way back on their fish mis first missionary journey. So he goes via land and visits all those places comes upon Ephesus and as he arrives in Ephesus he finds these 12 guys now he finds these 12 guys that are believers in Jesus but he senses just like um, Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos he senses there's something missing and upon asking them he says um, did you receive the Holy Spirit and of course the guys say we haven't heard of the Holy Spirit and so he shares with them and it's the first evidence of um,
Paul actually rebaptizing these guys and then laying hands on them and the Holy Spirit um, comes upon them and they speak in tongues and they prophesy. So there's this very powerful moment. And I love that because Paul maximizes every believer's potential by ensuring that they have the whole picture. That is what he does. And then he stays working in, um, in the synagogue in Ephesus for three whole months. So he taught openly and fearlessly in, in the synagogue and he was very persuasive and he did very, very well. But after a while, there seems to be a pattern. He starts there and then things get a bit, you know, doodlelly and so the Jews' jealousy wells up and he has to move on. And so he gathers and withdraws all the people that he's converted and he has to look for somewhere else. So he went to the synagogue. Obviously, he was maximising the opportunity for people that gather around the word already. So he gathered with them around the word. But as things went sour, then he withdrew, took the believers and the converts that he had, and he was very successful in that. He then gathers them and he has to look for something else. So he's maximising a very sad opportunity, really, when, when the synagogue said, you can't preach here anymore, and he withdrew because they were having a go at the people of the way. He, he finds... Um, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And we don't know exactly who Tyrannus was. Tyrannus comes from tyrant. I can't imagine anybody naming their child tyrant. You never know. Um, maybe that was what um, Tyrannus' students called him, the tyrant. But he discovers that in Ephesus, people go to bed between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. to have a siesta, like in Spain. It's a rest time because of the heat of the day. So they work early take a break and then re-establish business at the end. So Paul finds this lecture hall of Tyrannus and so he opens a ministry school in Ephesus in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So what an amazing thought that is. So we find here um, in verse 10, every day over two years he taught them in the lecture hall of Tyrannus which resulted in everyone living in the province of Asia, Jews and non-Jews, hearing the prophetic word of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, that just blows my mind. Everybody in the province of Asia hears the word of God. Now, if we go into the churches of um, Revelation and we look at what happened, Ephesus is in the middle and the 12 churches are all around that they all circle Ephesus. So Paul was very effective in planting all these churches that would establish, he didn't even go there, but he established them through this school. They would come to the school of Tyrannus in the lecture hall between 11 and 4. He would lecture in the ministry school and then they would go back to their own places and um, establish churches where they came from. Amazing that everybody in the province of Asia heard God's will and God's word. The power of God was so very profound. Um, we read that people would take Paul's sweat bands. It says handkerchiefs. That's a nice way to say it. These are bands. Look, this guy was making tents with goat skin. They would use goat oil and to make um, the, the weave of the, the goat hair waterproof and stunk it was a very smelly business they were always down by the sea because the sea breeze would take away some of the awful smell but they stunk so what they're using is these handkerchiefs that they wipe the sweat and the oil and the stuff off their brow and the aprons which would have been drenched in this awful smell they would lay these items on people who were either sick or possessed by evil spirits and they would disappear. The power of Paul was so profound. And in Ephesus, where it was a centre of occultism and um, the goddess Diana, um, these people um, were just so affected by this miraculous stuff that was going on with Paul. Great miracles were happening. I mentioned before that in Ephesus, um, the occult was very, very profound and it, it occurred a lot. And so there is 12 of these, um, sorry, seven Jewish guys. I've got the numbers all mucked up in my head. Um, these seven um, Jewish guys who were um, 
the sons of Sceva, the high priest, they decided that they'd go out casting demons because there was so much demonic activity in the town of Ephesus. And they were doing something interesting, though. They were exercising, but they were using the name of Jesus. Now, let's have a look at that in verses 13 and 14. And it says, Now there were seven itinerant Jewish exorcists, sons of Sceva, the high priest, who took it upon themselves to use the name and authority of Jesus over those who were demonized. They would say, We cast you out in the name of Jesus, that poor preachers. Well, this was a very big mistake for these gentlemen because one particular day when they did that, they came upon a man that was possessed by a demon and they said these very words, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches about. And the demon within the man answers back, well, I know of Jesus and I know of Paul, but who are you? And um, it backfired really badly for these gentlemen. Um, and, and the demon within pounced upon them, tore off their clothes and beat them and bruised them badly. And they escaped very, very um, thinly with their lives. And I was just thinking about that. Um, the demon said, I know Jesus and, and I know Jesus and I know Paul. Would the demons, if we went to say, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, would they know who we were because of our association with Jesus? These poor guys, they didn't. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They had no right to be calling out demons in his name. And it came out really badly. But where would we be if we stood in those shoes? Would we be able to call upon the name of Jesus like that? Well, after the word got around in Ephesus of this occasion where the demons just pounced upon these guys who were trying to cast them out and tore them to shreds. The superstitious Ephesians just were brought to their knees. They were so fearful. The name of Jesus brought on this, this absolute hallowed form. They were so in awe of the name of Jesus. And many of them who had been practicing occultism took out all their spell books and all their scrolls and their incantations and they took them out into a public place and they decided that they were going to burn them. Now, when the value of these books was estimated, um, if we look at it, it was, um, if we look at the silver pieces, 500 silver pieces were roughly um, a man's wages. And if we put it in today's vernacular, it was probably several million dollars worth of books and incantations and scrolls were burnt on that day. Um, an awful situation brought revival. The unfortunate fate of the exorcist brought maximum repentance and those practising the occult. Well, Paul at this point was getting itchy feet. He'd established a ministry school. He had spread the gospel right through the province of Asia Minor, which is just an incredible feat. Um, and he knew something was going to happen, but he sends Timothy and Erastus ahead to Macedonia and he stays behind. He remains in Ephesus, and a good thing too. He was very effective at winning souls, but there was a wealthy businessman that was getting pretty ticked off at him. The guy's name was Demetrius. He was a businessman who was a silversmith, and he used to um, take part in, in making idols. Now, if you recall, the goddess of Ephesus, they were the, 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 the I guess, the guardians of Artemis or Diana, as we know. In Ephesus, there was her temple, which was, I think, four times the size of the um, Acropolis in Athens. Ma massive building. They believe she fell from heaven, so she was born just outside of Ephesus where the temple was. And she was a big thing, so there's this huge temple. And they're about to go into this um, month-long, like five-day big celebration in May of the goddess of Artemis. And in this, lots of tourists came, came to the town of Ephesus or to the city of Ephesus, and they would buy trinkets. It's like today. If you go to a certain place, you can buy trinkets. If you go to Paris, you get the Eiffel Tower. If you go to um, Spain, you might get a bull and a bullfighter. If you come to Australia, you get the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Well, if you went to Ephesus during this festival, you would buy um, a little silver model of this goddess and they would usually include the great big arena that they had there 
which used to hold about 25,000 people, massive, massive. It was the biggest arena in the ancient world back then. But they would um, incorporate this little mould of, of this thing with the goddess Diana in the middle. Now, this goddess Diana or um, Artemis was an ugly-looking thing. She was multi-breasted, awful-looking thing. She was the goddess of the hunt and the goddess of fertility. Um, and she brought a lot of wealth to these silversmiths and these... these um, these craftsmen that made these idols because not only were they little take-home things, they were also a personal God for these people. Now, Paul's preaching, of course, as we saw in the song, God was, we worship a God that isn't made by human hands. He is a God that takes um, nothing from us other than he just gives us everything. And so Paul was preaching of this God and although he wasn't dissing um, Artemis, he was certainly speaking to the people and they were being converted about worshipping something that was made by human hands. So Demetrius and all the people that followed him were getting quite um, worried that their, their livelihood was being stolen by Paul's preaching. So they start to, to um, gather up momentum and we read in verse 23... At that time, a major disturbance erupted in Ephesus over the people following God's way. So you remember Christians were known as the way back then. It began with a wealthy man named Demetrius who had built a large business and enriched many craftsmen by manufacturing silver shrines to the Greek goddess Artemis. Um, if we continue um, in verse 29 and 30, um, the entire city was thrown into chaos as everyone rushed into the stadium together, dragging with them Gaius and Articus, Paul's travelling com companions from Macedonia. And when Paul tempted to go in and speak to the massive crowd, the disciples wouldn't let him. So um, Artemis just whips up the crowd and all these people rush into this huge arena. Most of them had no idea, like mob mentality no idea they got swept along and they couldn't obviously find Paul so they grabbed two traveling companions Gaius and um and his and the other friend that the Aristarchus who had come with him from Macedonia they drag them into this stadium and they start whipping up a frenzy for Two hours, they shout, the goddess of uh, goddess Artemis, she is wonderful and blah, blah, blah. And they go nuts. The Jews try to gather a guy called um, Alexandra uh, and they try to push him forward and say, you speak, you speak. And as soon as they found out he was a Jew, they yelled him down and it was just nuts in this stadium with everybody going crazy and many of them not even knowing why. So what happens? Paul wants to go in. Paul thinks, I'm going to go in there and speak to the people. He's fearless. He's crazy. If we look at Paul, he goes, Paul sees a crowd and he wants to speak to them. Paul attempts to maximise a volatile situation for God. But in this case, it doesn't work out. In verses 35 and 36, it says, eventually the mayor of the city was able to quieten them down. He said, fellow citizens. Who in the world doesn't know that we are devoted to the great temple of Artemis and her image fell from Zeus out of heaven? Since no one can deny it, you should all just be quiet. Calm down and don't do anything hasty. So um, he goes, well, the guys haven't done anything wrong. They haven't spoken against Artemis. They haven't stolen anything. And the biggest thing he was worried about, if they caused this great big public disturbance, um, remember they were under Roman rule and if they attracted the attention of the Romans, things could probably get a bit tough for them. So he said, just calm down. Don't do anything hasty. Settle down. And they listened to him. The city mayor disperses an angry crowd. And in this case, it's God's power over the governor that brings freedom to preach the gospel in Ephesus because it's discounted. He says to them, if you want to bring a legal thing against Paul, do it in the laws with Roman rule, but don't whip up a frenzy like this. So he virtually um, made it possible for the gospel to, be, to continue to be preached um, 
freedom. He maximised the power of the gospel because God used the power of the governor to do that. Now, we get into chapter 20. And we'll look at verse 1 and 2. And it says there, when the uproar finally died down, Paul gathered the believers and encouraged their hearts. He kissed them and said goodbye, and he left for Macedonia. At every place he passed through, he brought words of great comfort and encouragement to the believers. So after Paul had endured and settled everything down in Ephesus, he left behind him a group of elders and, and he, he went off to Macedonia. And as he was leaving, he encouraged what I love about Paul. He maximised every trip. He never wasted one single opportunity to encourage and love on people. So he gathers them together and encourages them. So from there, he dots through the Greek Isles and he stops and encourages people. And then he comes... Um, um, to Troas and on Sunday they gathered to take communion to hear Paul preach because he was planning to leave the next day he continued to to speak until past midnight <laughs> that's in verse 7 so um, the kids told a beautiful story about Acts chapter 20 and the story of this young man who fell out the window poor old um, Eutychus who fell out the window of a third story um, window and uh, to his death. So I love Paul because he maximised the time in Troas. I guess he realised he could sleep in the, in, the, in the ship and so he preached all night and he just took a short break. As this young man falls out the window, he stops preaching, which is after midnight. Obviously it talks about the flickering candles and everybody was sitting there and um, the kids said that Paul was probably boring. I don't know. If, people, if Paul was boring, um, it would be pretty hard to sit through um, a sermon till after midnight, let alone he comes back after he's raised this young man from the dead. They walk back up, they share communion, and he continues to preach till daylight. I think probably um, the preaching was a little bit more like um, Jewish style where there was questions at pausing and people shared, and I'm sure that was a really powerful powerful um, evening that Paul spent with those people and encouraged them. In verse 16 and 17, Paul was in a hurry to arrive in Jerusalem, hoping to make it in time for the Feast of Pentecost. So he decided to bypass Ephesus and not spend any time in that region. However, from Miletus, as he stepped through all these Greek islands, he sent a message to the elders of the Church of Ephesus and asked them to come and meet him. I love that about Paul. He maximises every opportunity. Have you noticed he never ministers on his own? He's always in a team. There's always a group of people with him. You know, um, Luke mentions himself at times when he's in and out of the trip where they, you know, sometimes Paul hears of rumours about um, people wanting to punish him or to take his money or whatever. We know at one point... They leave him and they go via ship. He goes via land because he's carrying a lot of money. He hears rumours that um, the Jews want to throw him overboard and get rid of him. Um, and so he goes via land. But he never wastes an opportunity to gather the team together. Seven men actually accompanied him supposedly on that ship to go across the Greek islands and then back to, to Jerusalem to take the funds from the churches in the pagan world back to the believers in Jerusalem. What a lovely thought. But Paul maximised every opportunity to coordinate and to build teams. He was a team builder. He always worked that way. He trained them, he encouraged them and discipled them and he trusted the Holy Spirit with them. So he trusted what he had done. What an amazing, what an amazing leader. When we look at verse 18b and verse 24, Paul comes back and as the, the, the elders from Ephesus arrive, he greets them and he's going to encourage them. Now he knows from, remember we talked um, that probably when Paul arrived, arrived in the pagan world, being a very closed-minded Jewish man, he would have found those places just an 
amazing culture shock. Shock. You think Athens would have been a culture shock with all the all the um, gods around. Remember, he preaches that sermon of the unknown god, and he says, um, um, "I want to." I want to introduce you to this God that you don't know the name of. This is the God that created heaven and earth. So the culture shock of so many gods. I, I forget, I read how many gods they worshipped. Um, Artemis was a big one for them, but there were just so many gods that they worshipped. And then they had in Athens, of course, this unknown God um, that they, they paid homage to as well. So Paul knew from the pagan worship and the horrible um, occultism the sexual immorality that worshipping these gods brought to these people, that the Ephesian elders had their work cut out for them. They they were in, you know, in right up to their ears. If they didn't depend on the Holy Spirit, um, they could easily lead their, um, lead, lose their crowd back to the enemy. You know, Paul had made huge inroads into the into breaking the power of the enemy. We know from that great big bonfire that much of the occult worship had been um, broken. But to this very day, in Ephesus, you can't find a a Christian church there. The the worship of um, Islam now takes a profound um, precedence in that area. And in Turkey, there's the power that was broken open and this seat of learning. Um, for the people of Ephesus and this this um, school of ministry that had, you know, fired up all of those churches in in and around Ephesus, is now gone. And so, as he gathers these people together, he meets them and he they they meet him um, in a seaport. He says to them in verse eighteen and twenty four, from the first day. That I set foot in Turkey, I've operated in God's miracle power with great humility and served you with many tears. It's clear here that Paul noticed how tough it was going to be to break the enemy's powerful, powerful bonds over Ephesus. And then he says, but whether I live or I die, it's not important. For I don't esteem my life indispensable. It's more important to me for, to fulfill my destiny and to finish the ministry my Lord Jesus has assigned to me, which is to faithfully preach the wonderful news of God's grace. And as he gathers them, you can hear the heartbreak and he says to them, you're not going to see my face again. This is my swan song. This is my dying legacy that you will have to, have to uphold what we have broken of the enemy's territory and continue to spread the gospel through this. So he gathers them together and they wept and they wept as they said goodbye to Paul. And I love this, that Paul knew the source of his maximisation. He knew that it was the Holy Spirit. He knew it wasn't him. Yes, he took risks. He was bold. He did all-nighters. He did crazy things. He was prepared to walk into crazy places of 25,000 um, person stadiums that were ready to tear him apart. And it wasn't the first time he was ready to do that. He was ready to speak out against um, the, uh, the gods that, that bought occultism and sexual immorality. He was willing to do all these things and to stand in the gap. But he knew that without the Holy Spirit, he had no power of his own. It was all to do with God and he had to rely. As we read back over his journeys, we realise that the Holy Spirit prevented him to go to Ephesus at one point and maybe that was because he needed to have a deeper relationship, to be more powerful in the Spirit, to confront the kinds of things that Ephesus was going to hold for him. And we know that the Holy Spirit was with him all the time. And what a powerful, powerful thing. And I love his humility. It's not about me. You know, um, I read a little part of, of in some history stuff of what Paul might have looked like. And he was a very simple man. Um, you know, not, not attractive in any way, shape or form. Not very big in stature. 
you know, they say he had bow legs and he was just, you know, bald and didn't have a lot going for him. And I'm sure as a tent maker, dealing with um, smelly goat hide and, and oil, and all, it, it didn't smell that great either. But they say that there were times when he looked like a man, but there were times when he had the face of an angel. And this man knew how to maximise the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I think of Paul's third journey, he was busting to get further on. If you recall, he's saying, I want to go to Rome. I want to be the seat of the Roman power. I want to get further than that. I want to go to Spain, the outer reaches. Um, but this was the last time he was going to travel this way as a free man. As he, um, It's interesting, he had, he had no idea what was awaiting him. He was taking funds back to the saints back in Jerusalem and he was trying to take um, a, gr a great financial um, offering to them. He had no idea what was awaiting him. He was arrested eventually and I guess he got to Rome but he did so in chains. The government paid, paid for his trip to Rome, which was quite expensive. But Paul maximised every situation. That's a story for the next little bit. But as we think of Paul, I want you to think do you maximise everything that God puts into your heart? If Paul can maximise, so can you. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to maximise your ministry? What's he calling you to do? We get really complacent sometimes at feeding ourselves and forgetting that, you know, in that video that I put up to start with to introduce the sermon today, it just says, I want to tell you something, that God loves you. The Great Commission is to say, God loves you. Are you maximising every opportunity that you can in this time when things aren't easy for everybody, when people are a little bit afraid of the future? Are you maximising your opportunities to tell people around you, to give them hope, to tell them that God loves you? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so, so much that you give us the example of Paul. And this week you've reminded us that we can maximise our circumstances, that instead of just rolling from one activity to the next, we should be looking at every opportunity to maximise the opportunity to to speak about you, to tell people of your love, your provision and your mercy and your grace. And so as we go from here, Lord, help us to take on the pull challenge to maximise every opportunity, to not waste a second, to not waste an encounter, to have influence over, um, I guess, our days in that we share them with people in, in a godly way not just going from one thing to the next. So bless us, I pray, and keep us safe. I pray by the power of your blood and in your name. Amen.